Okay, so welcome everyone. Welcome to this latest episode of the Conservation Careers podcast. Uh, and Happy New Year. This is the first one we've recorded in 2022. So it's kind of nice to be reconnecting. I hope you're all safe and well. I hope you had a good holiday season, whatever that was for you guys. Um, today, it's uh, one of the formats that we have of the podcast. We have two. The first one is interviews where I speak to conservationists about their jobs and their careers and we understand their journeys and we share their advice as well to kind of make the different um, jobs and, and journeys within um, the sector kind of more open and transparent. But then we have this other format that we've enjoyed playing with over the last year or so, which is where three of us get together, three co-hosts, and we discuss a topic or a theme that's of interest to you, our audience, and has often been suggested by you, our audience, too. So that's what we're here to do today. And today we have a new co-host with us, someone that we know really well within Conservation Chris, someone you might already know as well. Uh, but I'm really delighted, actually, to welcome and introduce Christy Foster to the Conservation Chris podcast. Hey, Christy. Hi. Hi, everyone. I am so thrilled to be here. <laughs> um, we we're just saying before this call that never in my wildest dreams did I expect to be on a podcast. And I'm, I'm finding myself here really excited about it. Oh, that's um, good. Yeah. I'm glad it's not a nightmare. It's a dream. It's great to have you in. Yeah, it's great to have you on the call as well. So um, and joining me as always, I should introduce you as well, sat there quietly as always, but very politely. Nando, Fernando Mateus Gonzalez from Bioblegear. Hey, Nando. Hi there. Hi, everyone. And, and, and welcome, Christy. I was looking forward to having you in a podcast, either in Spanish or, <laughs> or in English. <laughs> <laughs> That's it. And Christy, we should introduce you properly to the audience. I think a few people probably know you that recognize your name. You, you do a lot with and for conservation careers. You're our head of engagement. Uh, you've worked with us for now three years and you introduced me to Nando as well. So there's all sorts of connections between us. But yeah, um, yeah do you want to just like introduce yourself to the audience? Tell us a little bit about yourself. Sure, sure. Um, well, I'm really thrilled to be here. I, um, I'm Christy. I have a master's in conservation biology. Um, I'm Canadian originally. That'll probably become obvious from my accent <laughs> <laughs> or a choice of words. At some now point. it makes sense. Uh, but I've I've kind of traveled and and worked in conservation for close to ten years across a few different continents um, and a few different sort of job types. So there's been lots of science communication and and communication generally of conservation. Mm. Um, there's been a bit of environmental education, some ecotourism. Um, some field work, which was fantastic, thrown in the mix and in, in mostly in Latin America and South America. And um, I guess I first connected with you, Nick, about, what, eight years ago, 2014, something like that. Yeah, it's seven um, or eight years, isn't it? Yeah, CC turned yeah. eight last I year. I've and... never heard this story. I am. Ah. <laughs> <Very> <laughs> Yeah, so I, I was working in the in the UK at the time for an organization called Fauna and Flora International um, in communications, and uh, a friend who I met there in in Cambridge in the UK told me about conservation careers and and that it was just sort of starting up and that they were looking for bloggers, and I thought, oh, well, that's really cool. Um, so I ended up applying uh, to to volunteer as a as a part time conservation careers blogger, uh, where basically I would go out and I would, I would interview conservationists um, who were working professionally and then write up what they did in interviews. Um, and that would get published on, on the site. And so that's, that's how I met Nick. I think we had a, like a Skype call yeah. back in the days before Zoom. Yep. And, uh, I remember and then well. I did that for yeah. a number of years. <laughs> yeah. Such yeah. a nice success case <laughs> it's nice and i remember like christy i remember the skype call actually you know we welcomed a group of bloggers our first volunteer bloggers i think who came in to do the interviews and, and get kind of promotion and support in return and i remember then the quality of the stories that you then wrote the interviews that kind of followed and you you just showed very clearly you had a real a real talent for writing and for communicating and a passion for conservation too and genuine at the beginning i said to myself if we ever get to the point that we can hire someone you're such an, an obvious threat we'd love to hire you and I guess nearly three years ago that came true yeah. two and a half yeah 
Yeah. Funnily enough, you you actually wrote that to me in an email once and I read it and I was like, ah, ha, ha. You okay. know, <laughs> he doesn't actually mean that. Yeah, we know sometimes the pieces fit. It's like, I really did mean it. Yeah. And then, and then yeah. yeah, all the stars align some years later. So, yeah. so here I am. But that that lack for writing, we have we have talked about it many other times. That uh, well, Christy and I have commented on each other's drafts sometimes, and and it felt so. I mean, it connected so well. Like, uh, yeah, I know exactly what you mean. This is such a good suggestion. Mm. It's mm. I I feel this this writing connection with few people, and I think you have it. You mm. really oh. have. It. <laughs> totally yeah. great. Yeah. But speaking to <laughs> now, how do you guys know each other? Because you guys also met independently. Yeah, no, I feel like you should you should tell that story. <laughs> yeah, <It's your> <laughs> I love it. I love I love the serendipity of it. It's it's so nice. <laughs> um, back this was 2017, I think. Yes, 2000 like yeah yeah that's late cool. late summer <laughs> 2017. Uh, and I was coming back from the jungle, like getting literally out of the jungle into a little village in in Peru, and and then Christy appeared there to to welcome us to civilization again. <laughs> and I was there, all dirty and smelly, and and almost talking through guttural sounds, and and then Christy appeared there all. <laughs> beautiful and clean and, and happy and, and we ended up all dancing together all all of us and all the expedition members and the welcome committee and, and it was it was such a nice encounter and the funny thing is that we didn't talk much that time I was doing some some work in one side you were working on other projects in the village and we didn't have like plenty of opportunity to to talk but Years later, like I don't know, yes, two years later or something like that. Yeah, at least I think. I, I think you you found me on LinkedIn and and then we were chatting about uh, using some some parts of of the of my profile for some guide. And then is is when I asked you what was it for, and and then you told me about Nick about conservation careers, and I was all surprised and ah, oh, but this is great. How how did you end up working with with Nick and in this platform and I do something similar but a very uh, much smaller scale and and then I send you a video and then you show that video to Nick and then we all got together and it was mm. it was such a nice mm, encounter it was the jungle the jungle mm, introduced ourselves yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it was <laughs> quite the experience to see this group of people who've been literally living in the jungle in the forest for how long was it two weeks yeah something like that two or three so you can weeks. Imagine, like no showers no no anything yeah in the river. <laughs> and we had to be in a confined space with them within a building so we were a little bit worried about that <laughs> <laughs> i'm just kidding we were, we were all of us you know working in the field on and off but, uh, but yeah how cool is it to have have met in a tiny village in the Amazon and then reconnect two years later and, and end up all working End up in, in the same podcast. <laughs> same <Yeah>. podcast. <laughs> yeah, no, yeah. And it's the serendipity of it, isn't it? It's like, as you say, it's what it shows to me, and I sort of see it time and time again, we all do, is that conservation is quite a small world and we're very connected to one another and to other people. Like Christy used to work in comms at FFI and only the other day, totally independent to that we were talking to ffi and a lady there from their communications team as well and they were talking about something else that used to relate to my old career and like almost every person you meet there's a connection i think between you within this within this kind of sector and i think that's, that's one of the nicest things i think really and the introductions you get like you introduced me and then and that's just been so valuable and you know, and I sort of see that as one of the main things we try and do in conservation careers is connect people, <laughs> whether they work in similar areas or they need support on a certain theme or whatever it might be. It's such a, yeah, such a nice thing. Well, formally welcome, Christy, as a, as a new co-host. It's great to have you. And thanks, as always, Nando, for, for coming along too and joining us and supporting us. It's great. An honour. Ah, 
Now, Christy, you know the podcast anyway, because you very kindly yeah. post them for us um, every other week too. So <laughs> you've heard this all before, but now you're on the inside. Um, what we typically do is we kind of pick a theme and then we talk around that theme. Um, and this time we actually posted into our community, you know, has anyone got any ideas or things they'd like us to talk about on the podcast this, this year? We got a bunch of great suggestions from that. And we looked at that just yesterday and kind of trawled through and kind of picked out the first topic we'd like to discuss um, on this podcast today. So, and that one is, and I apologize, I didn't kind of write down as to who it came from. I could find that a little bit later. But the theme that they suggested that we like the look of was the good, the bad, and the ugly, which relates to that, the realities of working in conservation. Okay, so and I was saying just before the call, actually, you know, that's something I think that relates really quite well to our mission at Conservation Careers, which isn't to kind of glorify conservation, but just to make it more transparent and honest and accessible. Okay, so I'm very happy and we should be very happy to kind of talk about, you know, the the extremes really, you know, the great stuff and also the bad stuff and just to say this is what it's like. So if it's right for you, you know, we're here to support and welcome you into it. So so I think it's a really good, to- good topic, actually, so we can kind of get our Brilliant. teeth stuck into. Lots to talk around within that, the realities of working in, the pros and cons, however you want to frame it. Um, and if we get time, there was a follow up as well, which is about how do you find good organizations from bad organizations too? I guess if we've had time, we can talk about that as well. So the good, the bad and the ugly of working in nature conservation. <laughs> Where do we want to start with that one? Yeah, what do you usually do, the bad or the good? <laughs> it's like, which news do you prefer first? <laughs> <laughs> People always say when you give feedback, you kind of the, the praise sandwich. Have you heard that? <laughs> uh, that's a good way. You're really good at this. I think you did a brilliant job at that. So this could be a little bit better, but you're fantastic at that. But it was the middle bit that everyone was interested in. Yeah. Maybe we, we should start. name for that, which I won't say. <laughs> oh, really? Okay. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> Slightly more rude. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's for the after show. Um, mm-hmm. Should we start with the good? It seems like an obvious place to go. Yeah, like what when you think about working in conservation, you think about your careers so far and other people you know that are working in the sector, like what what do you think are some of the really, yeah, the positive aspects of, of a career working in conservation? Like what, what kind of jumps to mind? And I'm going to... Yeah, Nando, go on. Yes. <laughs> the, the very obvious one is, is the mission, no? Is, is that you do something and, and it's inherently good. It's, it's not that... It's not an anonymous, random job where where what you do doesn't have a direct application to something good. No, we are doing some things to improve our environment, our surroundings, the place where we live. So that's, I mean, that's already a, a million points, no, or something like that in this core. Yeah, yeah, I, t- I totally agree. Like it's that sort of sense of mission, isn't it? I think um, there's. It's funny, like when you were in conservation, there are so many different types of jobs and some of them are very similar to jobs on the outside of the sector. You can work in communications and marketing for Virgin Media or you can work for the RSPB or WWF or whatever. Day to day, the nuts and bolts are quite similar in what you're doing. Mm -hmm. You're pushing emails, you're attending meetings, you're having Zoom calls, whatever it might be. But it's that deeper purpose that you know that what you're doing is trying to create a better world or, you know, however you want to kind of frame that. Yeah. And I think that that has to, and as long as you connect to that purpose, then I, I remember having a conversation with someone from FFI, bizarrely, you know, on a podcast three or four years ago now. And he sort of said, you know, mid career, as I guess we all are now, um, you want to find an organization where you, you, you align in terms of your, the, your mission and their mission, you know, and it's very, it'd be easy to jump into a conservation organization and not fully align with their, their, their purpose if you like and, and that connection not to be there but if you do have that then it's such a great a great motivator yeah and um, yeah. and so there are many many causes for everyone to choose from yeah so it's, it's good to choose the one you will work best for you <laughs> yeah so if you're in a position yeah. of being able to choose yeah sorry christy i was yeah i was just gonna say you know sometimes it's it's actually strange and and odd when you have a you know a conversation with someone who works in a totally different field where they're not aligned with what they're doing where it doesn't Mm. match up with their values and and it makes me realize actually how privileged many of us are when we find that um, because there's there's no misalignment between you know the what you want to achieve and what you want to do and the kind of person you want to be and and the role that you're in they Mm. just they fit Um, and it's hard to imagine 
you know, going from that to going back to doing, um, and I've done many other types of jobs, you know, part-time jobs in my life. It's hard to imagine going back to that kind of work where, where there isn't that mission part. Yeah. And I think we see a lot of people at conservation careers, a lot of people switching into the sector for that reason. Yeah, mm. Basically for the mission. Yeah, yeah. Mm. For the mission. Mm. Yeah. There's a, there's a great YouTube video by a guy called Simon Sinek. It's been watched millions of times about the, the was it? it um, it's about the power of why I think it's called that. And to me, like the mission is like, why, like why you're doing something. And his mantra is something like, don't tell me what you're doing. Tell me why you're doing it. He says that like, I don't know, 20 times through like a, you know, a 10 minute kind of YouTube clip. And I think that's the, that, that to me is the mission really like, you know, what I'm doing is pushing emails and managing Facebook comments or whatever it might be. But why I'm doing it is because I'm trying to, you know, help people and help the environment. And it's that, it's that why piece that is totally yeah, uniting and motivating for conservationists. Yeah. Gives you the strength, I guess. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, 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 yeah. So that's a really strong one. Yeah. Any other kind of big positives that stand out for you, you think, for kind of working in the sector that people should know about that maybe they don't already I think, I think another one we mentioned is is the community, right? <laughs> it's that we are a small, close knit community that we yeah. can know each other or at least know a, a middle person that can introduce to more excited and mission driven people. So then that that links us all very well, and it's it makes it a more comfortable, kind place to work. Yeah, a lot of shared values and, and a really supportive, generally a, a supportive community of, of super passionate, motivated people. Yeah, I, I totally, I totally agree. I think it is the people un, underneath it. We, as an example of that, because I do think we're quite a friendly, open group of people, possibly more than others. I don't know. I haven't got much experience of other sectors, but to me, my my basic assumption is always, you know, if. I'd want to communicate or talk to or you know network with or whatever with another person the the vast majority of the time that will be successful that person will be happy to be contacted by a stranger and will want to help intuitively because we're on the same page we're both trying to do something quite similar and you know we've done a lot of interviews like blogs like you know Chris used to do as a volunteer blogger for us and we've spoken to now hundreds of people and shared their stories and um I'm not aware of a single person that said no yet you know when when we've you know interacted and said you know interested in your work could we talk to you or ask some questions about what it's like and share it with our audience and I know we're in a privileged position because we're a careers advice service and you know we have a platform but you know I still think even without that most people are really open and that's that's the the open you know the the open friendly people we have the same mission statement I guess in the corporate world if someone else does something similar to you you're in competition you could be in competition, but actually, largely speaking, I think within conservation, if you're both working on marine conservation or whatever it might be, rewilding or something, then actually you probably should be partners and you should work together and try and, you know, there's economies of scale and all sorts of reasons for doing that. Yeah, so totally, I think the people behind it, we're, we're passionate, we're friendly, you know, we, I guess, largely pretty fun, although it's a serious topic, <laughs> you mm-hmm. know, yeah, that, that certainly seems like a major benefit to me is the people that are there. So if you're working in an organization, I was talking to my wife over lunch about this, and she's a conservationist too, and she goes, you know, if I go to the tea room at work, she knows she's, even though she's talking to an accountant and, you know, a program manager or whatever, they've got that they've got that thing that they're all into wildlife and they're all saying, oh, Sparrowhawk, you know, flying across the window or whatever. <laughs> but she did the same work for um, the team next door of, um, I don't know, estate agents or something. She might be doing similar work, but that, that, that kind of, that connection again, that why that purpose is missing. And that, that, that's quite a big difference in terms of you're just, you know, you're just interacting with quite a different set of people who have different backgrounds and yeah, interests and yeah. Whereas there's that basic connection for conservationists, yeah, that we all feel. Absolutely, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. I feel like we've we've missed one of the maybe one of the things that most people think of when they they imagine conservation, which is the like adventurous sort of out in the wild field work and experiences to which you know in in some often it's it's hard and it's tedious and it's long in the actual reality of it but the few moments of it 
make it all so worthwhile. Mm. Um, and I think, you know, many conservationists, certainly not all, but many conservationists get to experience very privileged moments actually mm. with wildlife that a lot of people would struggle to be able to do or, or would need to be able to pay to, to do. Um, like I remember a moment with a, a very, very early morning, I think getting up 3.30 a.m. and seeing a tapir in the Peruvian Amazon, those moments, like that moment will stay with me forever, mm. knowing that I was there in that area helping in some way to, to protect that landscape. It's, it's, um, a, it's a very good one. Like it, it, I, I bet that we all three started through that, right, Christy? Like, mm -hmm. like because of the animals or the wildlife. Yeah. But now at the beginning, we have gone to all other things, no? We, we have mentioned yeah. other goods. Uh, yeah. I think more than Christy and I, you stay quite connected to the front line though, Nando. You know, with your work, you still get out in the field as regular as you can, it seems. You know, you want to be out there studying the otters and yes. the shushliks <laughs> and, you know, and, and leading expeditions back to the Amazon and things like that. So... Yeah, it does feel like there's a progression away from the field and more into the office. But if you want to stay rooted to, you know, what you're passionate about, you can do it. Yeah, I'm trying to hold on to it for dear life. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to go away. <laughs> Despite funding proposals and papers and other yeah. stuff that comes your way. Statistics, yes. <laughs> Statistics, yeah. Yeah. Well, maybe yeah, yeah it's a very, very important part. It, it, and it, I really think it was that was because i started that's why that was my why at the very beginning yeah but then uh, along the way i think we all discovered that hey actually this is very good also because of the people and and having the mission yeah 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 we've talked about it before but people often get into conservation because of wildlife or a moment or some connection for me it's barn owls mm -hmm. and you know i have a, a big deep passion for i still do but i'm less involved in that nowadays but there is this natural inclination like you say to kind of be more about the people and the connection and and actually that might be working with you know communities of people to solve problems as well people often think that local communities are, are the problems you know at this forest or this reef or whatever it might be but actually they're also the solutions and the partners and yeah to solve conservation problems you've got to work with people across loads of different types of yeah divide so yeah that's sort of the natural progression as well no I guess, way to make it sustainable yes. yeah so it feels like there's progression from animals to people and from field work to office work and but there's there's ways of sort of navigating those things depending upon where your why might be yeah, yeah. i think for me that was actually the first moment where i thought i'd always like i grew up on the west coast of canada i was always in nature that was my playground um i was really fortunate in that way but it was the moment where I, I recognized the connection between people and nature, um, you know, and how when one suffers, often the other one does too. And when one benefits, often the other does. That was when I thought, ooh, conservation. <laughs> That's where I want to be. Um, so it was actually recognizing that, that it is always people. Yeah. Um, it's interesting, um, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. Another thing I was thinking about too, in terms of like a um, part of the good from the better than the ugly, but the good piece nowadays we can talk about it in a while actually in terms of diversity there's real issues around inclusion i think within the sector and you know we're all white right you know there's a an issue of um equality in terms of different backgrounds but one thing i think is a real positive in the sector and it's definitely been a trend in the last 10 20 years is actually there's a lot more women in conservation now i would say more than men you know we had a zoom call recently supporting a recent cohort that kind of you know came through our boot camp and there was me and maybe i don't know 10 or 15 other people who are going through the call um came to a live q a and i was the only man you know it was it, it was it was and i remember at university i used to kind of help out in a master's course every summer and there was maybe 15 or 20 students sort of similar number and every year it was four blokes and you know 15 ladies and then it's three blokes and 17 and then it was another five and 15 it was 75 percent ladies i think at least and that seems to have kind of led into the sector now as well. Like most early career conservationists, I would say, are ladies and, and pretty middle career. And there's several CEOs now, you know, CEO of JNCC here in the UK, the RSPB, BirdLife International and others. They're ladies, you know. And so I think it's become 
um, for good reasons, you know, quite sort of female dominated, actually. So that gender equality that we see problems in some sectors, I think, doesn't seem to be such an issue here in conservation. Feel free to disagree, but that, that's my that's my impression anyway. Yeah, I agree. I think it probably depends a lot on the country and the, the region and context. And, yeah. You know, it'd be different here than it would be in in Africa, South America, et cetera, um, yeah. in terms of that gender equality, because culturally there are, you know, there's differences. But I, I think overall, certainly in the, in the, a lot of the organizations and, and contexts that I've worked in, in you know, Canada and, and the UK and, and Australia, it's, it's felt very balanced, mm-hmm. even, even almost unbalanced to the point where you say there's, there's more women and <laughs> women are actually having more of a say in, in some cases. So, well, yeah, of I course, it depends on the, on the activity, a specific role or a specific activity, but it, it does feel that, or from what I mm, gather from my emails, uh, the ones I received for, for my blog or, or even the, the visits to the blog, it, it feels when they when when readers write to me, it, women come across as, as much more committed, much more detail oriented, much mm-hmm. passionate maybe, or more they they feel the mission uh, in a more intense way. Or that's mm-hmm. my feeling from from my side. But it's mm-hmm. true. Uh, we, we need to get out of the way then though and just let them do it <laughs> <laughs> we're holding them back <laughs> yeah. i think i think women um have a natural tendency to want to care and support and help yeah. others and that that extends not just to people but to yeah. the environment Pro- probably to that life. helps also with the competition and all this uh, connection yeah possibly yes <laughs> We do see, like we did a, another question actually is around imposter syndrome we were asked about as well and, and confidence. And I can't remember the study, but there's something recently saying that if, you know, if a man sees a job and they have, say, I don't know, 75% of what the employer is looking for, they're much more inclined to go for it than a woman who actually sort of sees that actually they, they're not quite good enough yet. And there's like a, there's a difference in confidence levels, almost bravado, I guess, you know, in terms of perhaps men being a bit overconfident and perhaps women being a bit underconfident. That might be a big generalization, but it feels like, you know, there is that sort of different approach to work. And it'd be really interesting to see actually, you know, as I think women are dominating in certain areas, will that change how we do conservation and will that change the culture and the sort of practice? And mm-hmm. I don't know, I don't know what the outcome of that would be, but it, it, it feels like a positive thing anyway. It feels like, we should, you know, it feels good to have, yeah. Bought those things into a, a more safer, life. more comfortable place. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Maybe that's why it's more open and <laughs> friendly. Yeah. There's tend to be fewer egos. <laughs> yeah. Any any more good then before we kind of move on to the kind of the the less good, the bad, and the ugly. I've been, I've been thinking while we were saying this good that always the counterpart. I think it's quite yeah. likely that we will jump in and out of the good and the bad. Yeah, yeah. It feels yeah. that way, doesn't yes. it? Yeah. Hard to think of one without the other. Yeah. Yeah. And what the solutions might be to some of these problems too. That's that's probably a chat for another day. Yeah. Mm -hmm. It could fill a whole episode. Yeah. So, I mean, we've talked a lot on the podcast recently and we'll continue to do so about like diversity um, in conservation. And we did, I did a great, it sounds really (laughs) up my own, um, but we had a good discussion on the Conservation Groups podcast with a guy called Cade London um from the joint diversity venture in for careers in conservation and he's a great guy hawaiian guy who published him recently where we talked about some of the issues faced particularly in north america and and in the us um about getting more people from different backgrounds into the conservation movement it's still dominated by quite a small demographic and also that i guess the deeper your pockets as well the more affluent you are the longer you can kind of sit it out in terms of applying for jobs or even volunteering and get experiences alongside, you know, your studies or even accessing studies, you know, so it does feel like the a bad side at the moment is it feels favored towards those people. Um, yeah. Who have a kind of more um, yeah, affluent background for want of a better word, I guess. And, and that is a problem. That's something that I think the society and, and we need to try and tackle is, you know, how do we get, you know, more, types and different types of people into the movement for them to see themselves as part of this movement 
for it to be accessible to them and uh yeah within everyone's means that there are kind of paths to entry and, and paths to impact if you like you know particularly in the early stages of career i think once you get your foot in the door things get easier and we've talked about that but that first job and the experience and education that kind of sits behind that first job um seems like the scales are kind of in favor of certain types of people and less in favor of others and that's that's not a good thing you know something that needs to be addressed yeah yeah yeah. and it is probably the same in many other sectors but mm. here is exacerbated by it's it's difficult to think of conservation as um how do i put this like productive no like it, it, many other sectors produce in bracket in, in quotes i'm quoting with my fingers produce money or resources or things but we do too but this is less you can sell it less no you can you can say that we are improving our environment and in the long term it will be best for everyone but given that there is no real money <laughs> that comes out there is much more competition you need to do that you need to do, to go through internships and volunteering and, and you need to stay 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 until you get that first job so then here is it's much harder is to get diversity because you if you don't get in having a lot of patience and <laughs> often the pockets yeah then, then you jump you got yeah i would yeah. say on that just i feel like we're going back and forth good bad <laughs> and, <laughs> yeah. and both i mean there's always the two sides of the same coin but um there are i think there is progress being made and i i think that there are often more opportunities out there than than a lot of people know about and and part of like a small part of that process is is making just those opportunities more available and making more people aware of of what they have access to um i'm i'm always surprised and i i find a lot of people are always surprised to learn just how many scholarship opportunities for example are, are available and other forms of funding um to support people obviously we need more and and that's only one small part of the the problem because like i think um we sort of talked about this a bit nick that mm. the very beginning is is sort of an education component if you're not aware of or engaged in conservation you know regardless of whether or not there's opportunities and support available to you it's not even a path that you're likely to to consider as an option uh, so it's complex sorry i went on a bit of a tangent there <laughs> yeah the first step right yeah it's like yeah. have you have you guys watched this this movie don't look up yeah not yet <laughs> on new year's eve yeah <laughs> it wasn't a feel good movie <laughs> no yeah. but uh... um But yeah, I, I just acceptance and recognition of a problem is the first step, really, isn't it? So we are, it's definitely something that's talked about a lot more the last two, three years. And so hopefully, you know, lots of people are starting to think about it and trying to address the problems. Um, yeah, and yeah, I totally agree, Chris. There's a lot more. I mean, part of part of the way we tackle it is just by showcasing everything that's out there. It's part of the reason my CC was set up to say, look, if you go to a typical job board, you'll only find a small selection of the jobs because you know advertisers are paying for those jobs and that's what they list, you know. Whereas actually what we do is we go out and hunt and find as many as possible. And there's loads out there, lots and lots, you know, and the same with scholarships too. So realizing the full breadth and depth of opportunities is sort of hopefully one way of kind of addressing the balance yeah and sort of people find their place within the sector uh yeah. but it's a big it's a big problem yeah it's a big problem that, that is going to take a long time to tackle probably but yeah any other kind of downsides we want to share it feels like a downer but i think it's important to kind of <laughs> to share the realities <laughs> reality yeah, yeah. I, i can share a very recent one which mm. is go on <laughs> I, I came back from the holidays and my first task in my conservation job was to to do autopsies for close to 60 dead otters mm. that we have been collecting from roads mostly here in the Czech Republic. And that is part of the job, an important part of the job, at least in my in my job here. Uh, but I hate it. <laughs> it's yeah. just like you do it because someone has to do it and you need to know what the problems are and why so many others are dying. And 
and it's the same with any other species but and then you you have to sit there well or stand most of the time and then do this horrible thing and i hate yeah. it i don't like it but at the same time yeah well it can be interesting and it's especially and most importantly useful and so what you get the information you get you can use later, later as, as leverage you can use it to improve the situation uh, but oh boy yeah. <laughs> it's, it's something i would rather not have it to do <laughs> yeah so it's not always very um, glamorous yeah yeah. And yeah, by the way, I shared a photo of, of a couple of these otters with Nick and I, mm -hmm. and it's it's a little bit heartbreaking. Yes, the WhatsApp pictures, yeah, yeah. <laughs> of dead otters. Like, what is there anything you can share about what you've learned through doing that? Like, what is there anything you've noted by autopsying, you know, 60 odd otters? Like, what any positives? Well, uh, the first thing you notice is that most, the immense majority of these deaths are, are from the roads, are traffic, traffic yeah. hits. Uh, and that, uh, a positive from that is that it, it led to more ideas on how to avoid uh, traffic collisions. So one thing we did here in a, in a very black area, uh, it's, a, it's like a dam and, and there is a road on top of the dam and there we get lots of animals it's it's like it's, it's killing lots of animals every day mm. it has a lot of traffic and and they, it, they it's the only place they can cross so what we did was to create um a little barrier along the road with a tunnel so mm -hmm. that they animals are naturally led to that tunnel and and then we have noticed it. I mean, we put several camera traps and, and we keep track of the, the death tally. Mm -hmm. So apart from noticing that less animals, particularly terrestrial animals are dying there, mm -hmm. uh, we see all this. I, I have to show you that video too. <laughs> all these animals, different animals that are using the tunnel. And it's, it's like you are watching, I don't know, the jungle book, all animals together <laughs> crossing in the tunnel. It's, and it makes you feel like useful. Okay, we found a problem. We fix it here. Now we can show the solution to the rest of the world and, and hopefully get other, other places to, to fix it, to, to fix their own problems like that. So I think this was just because uh, well, we were... There was someone and there was a, a group of people counting the, the the daughters and trying to find out if there are many or not dying. Yeah. This is, is across all the species and environments, like for example, the suspected insect uh, decline. No. Mm -hmm. If mm -hmm. if there is no one counting, we are mm -hmm. going to lose mm -hmm. lots of things if if, mm -hmm. if you don't go look for it. But it might be like in this case, it might be a horrible job, no? Or a, picking up carcasses from places like it's not the most glamorous or happy yeah. as i was saying through whatsapp i sent a photo of of me holding in the in the lab holding a a, a little cup of mm. another it was like a fluffy little thing that was peacefully sleeping mm. <laughs> and and i told you both that it was the hardest like it, there were uh, or uh, rotten corpses from mm. the water that should have been harder technically to do an autopsy on but mm. but this fluffy thing having to well, that, that's very 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 difficult and at the same time well very interesting and useful yeah yeah mm. I think you make an interesting point as well about monitoring as well and that the importance of monitoring and it's a lot a lot of particularly scientific activities around doing surveys and censuses and seeing how is the population or the habitat, you know, the forest extent or the otters in Czech Republic or whatever it might be. There's a, a lot goes on and tracking that over time, yeah. you know, they're going up, down, if they're going down, why they're going down, what do we need to do about skylarks or turtle doves that are vanishing here in the UK and other things like that. And I think probably one of the, one of the downsides of that is more often than not, we're seeing species in decline. You know, when we present new findings as a community, whatever that might be, like the state of the world's birds, it was a bird life report, or state of nature, WWF report, like every five years, largely speaking, they're pretty negative reports. They're talking about, you know, the declines and how we, almost as a conservation community, we're sort of 
monitoring loss. We're observing loss and yeah. recording it and documenting it really well. And we're doing our best to tackle it. But largely speaking, we're losing the battle still, you know, and we're, tack- we're, we're trying to tackle some really big problems, really intricate problems, which need often societal change, you know, and we're here on the front line doing our best. But it's, it's I think a real downside is that feeling that, you know, we're kind of wading through treacle and it's really hard, you know. And so when we do have success stories, you know, we need to promote them and shout about them and energize ourselves from them as well and learn from them and, you know often media and PR teams, that's their job, you know, to promote those successes because it inspires more action. You know, I think also if we promote too many negative news stories and people tend to just move away and bury heads in sand and just, we don't want to hear it all the time. So, yeah, but I do think it's a problem. Like, yeah, we're, we're, we're sort of, it's quite hard to stay motivated when you see the sort of the bigger changes. Yeah. So kind of finding those things that work and, and repeating them is so important. Yeah. I think that was actually one of the suggested topics, you know, when you said, Nick, that you kind of asked our community what, what they'd like to hear about on the podcast this year. And that was someone used the term eco-anxiety, I think. Yeah, and I thought yeah, that was really yeah. interesting. Yeah. But, you know, this, this anxiety around that, can we fix this huge, enormous, like yeah. almost unfathomable problem that, that we're dealing with? And, and occasionally we even get asked by people who are sort of considering careers in conservation are we helping? Is it worth it? Should I actually get started in the sector if if it's all doom and gloom? Yeah. So, yeah, I also, I agree that it's like any news, you hear a lot about the bad stuff and there's lots of that. And we don't hear enough about the successes. Um, yeah. Like you just shared, Nanda, where, you know, you took a, a bad solution and, and observations and you turn that into a good. There's not enough yeah. of that. In the end, it's like like everything in life. No, you you have huge problems, but if you cut them in little pieces and then you solve those little pieces, it's 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 more rewarding. It's easier. It's more motivating, and it it works better. Yeah. And I think in conservation there are many many things that are working well and improving. It's like the big picture is very scary, but but it we are already many people working and and doing great things so there's hope guys <laughs> yeah yeah and you wouldn't work in this sector if you weren't hopeful and you weren't positive you really wouldn't i think every conservationist is the two things that, that are probably missing you know one is we need more people <laughs> yeah, yeah, working exactly. in conservation you know and that is linked to the second problem which is we need more support you know we need more funding or more innovative ways of raising funds beyond donations and you know, and the kind of charity model as well. Like, you know, we need new income streams to help us to grow more rapidly. That's that's yeah. the, the problem I think the movement has. There's like an inherent feeling, I think, when you talk to conservationists that we know what it is we want to do. We know how to tackle some of these problems. The solutions are there, you know, largely speaking, but we just, we can't scale things as quickly as we need to, to have the impact. So we, we're winning some bits, but we're losing other areas too. So, yeah, so if people are listening, I think, well, you know, conservationists, you know, they're, they're losing the battle and there's no point me thinking about it. no actually we need we need more <laughs> we need more people to <laughs> yeah, come in yeah. and support and help and kind of you know get behind it that's that's so important and actually that eco anxiety piece as well the comment christy that came through from the community that is a really interesting one. I, can, I can see it here how to stay motivated positive when working in a crisis field eco anxiety in brackets exactly that yeah the it's funny i know people who have eco anxiety and actually you know they 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 i'm not saying they, they they're not depressed but they're certainly very down you know and it affects them emotionally yeah absolutely and i think the the trick if there is a trick is to sort of realize that you know there's two ways to kind of feel about a problem it's actually it's my it's my dad that told me this years ago and i still sort of trying to hold on to the thought that you know when you have a problem you can be worried about it or you can be concerned about it and they're quite different things Worried means you, you're emotionally, you know, affected by that thing. You might, you know, be thinking about it all the time. You might be staying awake at night. There might be all sorts of negative consequences. Um, but concern just means you're aware of it. It's a problem, but it's not affecting me emotionally. You know, I've, I've got like a, a more kind of cerebral response to this thing and I can kind of keep it in a box <laughs> mm-hmm. and it's not going to get to me. You know, it's not going to keep me awake and that sort of thing. And you know, I guess that's sort of like a stoicism thing where it's like, well, I only, I'm only concerned and worried about the things I have control over too. I guess that is sort of another way of doing it. You know, there's a lot of stuff I can, 
I can't tackle climate change. There's no point in me staying awake mm -hmm. and worrying about that. I can do my bit, <laughs> but then there's a line that's drawn and I'm trying to live a happy life. I is in like, you know, the royal we, you know, it's like, so I feel that's, I feel like there's, there's a good distinct distinction if you, if you can somehow draw it between being worried and being concerned and, and it really affecting you deeply or you actually trying to tackle it, but also keeping it within, you know, a kind of, you know, within some boundaries that's good for you emotionally because well-being is so important nowadays. Otherwise, yeah, you really would be, you know, um, I know. Thank <laughs> in you a that. state. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Yeah, easier said than done, though. I totally get that. Yeah, you know, I worry about all sorts of stuff that I shouldn't worry about. <laughs> of course I do. Yeah. For, for me, sometimes, like, I say that the life is like a video game where <laughs> if it's too easy, it gets a bit boring, but if it's too difficult, you get, like... Yeah. It's, and you have to keep on choosing projects that keep you on the edge. On the edge. Like, they are... <laughs> a bit difficult but not too much and probably you know that you are gonna get to the end so if you feel that your problem or the conservation problem you you think is unsummarnable or is that yeah. a word yeah unsurmountable yeah <laughs> unsurmountable yeah <laughs> if you think it's like that just just divide it a bit more and then until you find that you can do something about it and then it reduces the eco anxiety a little bit. Yeah, that's good advice. I love that, like a computer game. <laughs> this is like the definition of, of flow, though. You know, exactly. when you have a problem yeah. or a challenge, and yeah. if the problem is here and it's this big, and your skills or your ability to do something about it is here, you're just, you're not going to do anything. You're going to feel completely overwhelmed. But the moment where you can either look at a problem or take a problem and break it down into something where you actually have an ability to take action and do something about it. Um, then suddenly you have this level of, of control and, and momentum almost. Yes. Yeah. And yeah. I feel yeah. like we just got very right. philosophical now. Yeah. <laughs> I think also like with challenge as well, like challenge can be a really positive. If you don't have any challenge in your career or your life, that can be a real lacking. You can be bored. Like, like you said, a game that doesn't work, but if there's too much, it's stressful. Yes. Yeah, so it's, it's exactly as you described. It's sort of getting that balance. Like where is that healthy, <laughs> healthy challenge? Yeah. Yeah. I think I like that about conservation. There are so many possible little and big problems to play with mm -hmm. and you never get bored this is this is something i love uh, and also the variety like i can do many different things and, and push forward on all of them <laughs> try at least that's so true yeah other kind of bad and uglies i've got a few notes here as well and sort of thinking through things that we haven't maybe talked about um i think one thing like the the sector is is dominated, I think, by charities. I don't mm -hmm. know what the percentage is, but I think most activities within the charity sector, you can work in conservation as an academic, largely, you know, you, you do a bit of that, Nando, but you do work for a charity as well. You know, you can work for the government. My wife does that, you know, and other areas, but still I think the charity sector dominates in terms of activity on the ground. Um, and, and this is a big, broad generalisation. <laughs> Um, but there are a number of charities that aren't particularly well run or professional in my view. You know, I, I think, you know, in terms of training and support and often it, a lot of it comes down to funding as well. You know, they don't have good systems and processes necessary to operate, whether that's administration or project management or whatever, you know, I, I'm not saying I have, or I haven't experienced it, but I know it exists within the sector and, you know, but, you know, there are big charities that are fantastic and small ones that are fantastic and everything in between. But I think broadly speaking, a sector that's dominated by charities also has um, an issue around the sort of the professionalism of a kind of the culture within a charity, as opposed to perhaps, you know, the, the professionalism, the sort of the well-oiled machine, for want of a better word, of something like a business. I'm not saying charities need to be more like businesses, but you can sort of see the, the the distinction I'm trying to sort of draw between the two. I've said the example before, like, and it sort of links to sort of dynamism almost as well. Like, you know, when I worked for, as a consultant for a couple of years, you know, um, that was a really fast paced, efficient, incredibly efficient kind of machine, if you like, that we were working with then. And it sort of blew my mind because I came out of academia to kind of be thrown and sort of spat out as a consultant for a couple of years. 
And one afternoon, you know, it's like half past four and we're all going home at five, a, a job dropped in that we need to do a badger survey tomorrow and it's 100 miles away. Um, and Nick, can you go and do this survey for us? And yeah, I can do that. But to do that, I need, I need a car and I need a map of the survey site as well. You know, I think I needed a hotel for the night or something too, because it was too far to get there and back in a day. Anyway, and within like two minutes of me even mentioning these things, the lady on the desk, the reception said, Nick, your car's going to be arriving in about 20 minutes. She'd booked it and it was coming already. You know, the guy who worked on the GIS mapping desk shouts across saying, we can do you a map, but we don't have that map player. We're going to need to buy the map player so I can print it out for you. It's 50 quid. And I, and I sort of said, okay, I'll do it. Yeah, that's fine. Yeah. Um, but we haven't got a code for that. We need a finance code so I can buy the 50 quid. I thought, ah, oh, here we go. And, and he just shouted across to the finance lady, can I have a code for the Badger survey? 3792. 3792. And it was printed out beside <laughs> me. The, the map printed out, you know, and by the time the map came there, the, the car was coming and the hotel was booked. And I was like, wow. I can't believe the efficiency of this. Like, I've never seen anything like it. You know, and everyone was real team. Everyone knew their roles. You know, the processes were really slick. You know, and sometimes it feels sometimes perhaps the opposite, you know, within other areas of the conservation movement where we need to be a bit more dynamic, a bit more on it. Don't work harder. We're all working really, work smarter, you know, just be be yeah. clever about how, how we kind of use tools available to us and, and how we operate. And I think, yeah, so there's there's room for improvement. Yeah, it's, it's, I, ha I, guess I have an example of what you just said from yesterday. It's also that that this this apparent uh, or or general generalizing no that yeah. that is less professional. Uh, it it's pervasive. It, it appears in the minds of people. And yesterday, someone made a comment, uh, something like, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something like, ah, but that's okay for an NGO, but we are the university. Huh. And then and then that. And that it is every in everybody's minds, and I guess it's a problem. It's mixed with that problem of lack of resources, and then you have to do patches if if you are in a small NGO, and then that that gets this this reputation. But actually, I mean, yeah, there are many many good ones, and and other ones that are trying their best. Yeah. But it, it, it gets this reputation and you feel this also in in conferences and in congress and uh, if you come from an ngo if they look at you with a bit more suspicion maybe mm. so that's uh, yeah that's something to fix and of course more more funding will help towards that yeah and it's definitely an opportunity it's just an opportunity i think probably for improvement yeah yeah sort of across the board we did actually have a follow-up question, which now might be a good time to kind of just touch on as well. Someone asked as well, how do you recognize the good from the bad organizations as well within conservation? Um, I don't know, have you got any ideas on that? Like if someone, if someone were in a, a privileged position of, you know, having five job offers from five different charities, for instance, you know, how could they gauge as to, you know, which ones were more professional and more efficient than, than others? There's no doubt that everyone's trying their best and working their hardest, but which ones are the the, the, the most well-oiled machines? Are there any kind of signals that people could kind of learn from? I think just, I mean, there's some things you can do that are quite easy and there's some that are a little bit trickier. Uh, maybe an easy one is just to look at who they're working with. Uh -huh, because yeah. generally if they're working with other organizations and other organizations that are reasonably well, well known or recognized um, or, or are, plentiful, chances are they're, they're being supported for a reason. Um, so I guess that's one way. I mean, there's, uh, the ideal would be just talking to their staff because the mm. staff have seen how things work inside and outside and, and yeah. you know, um, they've got like the behind the scenes perspective. So knowing if those staff are, are happy, no organization is ever perfect, I don't think. But, mm -hmm. you know, if, if overall those staff have positive feedback, that's a that's a pretty good signal. And if staff are sticking around, I guess also. Yeah. You're checking right. their track record and see what, what have they done so far? No, what, what I, a question I usually ask in interviews when I'm interviewing for a job, I, I ask them, what, what are you proudest of uh, in your company? What, what, what's the thing you do that 
you are proudest mm. and and that will tell you if they what they are doing is is top and also i i imagine uh, bad or good it will depend also on your aims your objectives no that maybe maybe for some stage in your career you will prefer to go to a smaller organization if you for example mm -hmm. i don't know want to to be to have to have a more say in the in the organization so you you will go to a small one that you can you can maybe help to steer to one place or another and then maybe those they don't have so many resources or they look like they are worse in in quotes again uh, on the other hand maybe if you are in another moment in your life where you require more stability or a more clear career path then you will want to go to a a big, a large one that maybe has other kinds of problems, no? other kinds of mm -hmm. challenges, like more, they are more stagnant or they have more, I don't know, <laughs> it can be anything. But yeah, it's this bad or good, mm, it can be also yeah, efficient <laughs> or, or good for your estate. Yeah, yeah, mm -hmm. you're right though, like in a small organization, they typically have people who so I guess we call them jacks of all trades. They're working across multiple different roles rather than being specialists that you might have in a much bigger organization where you have like teams of specialists across certain areas. So typically, yeah, small organizations, you're kind of doing lots of different things as part, and, and you might thrive in that environment that'll suit certain people down to the ground. They like the dynamism, they like, you know, the, the way they can get involved in different things and every day is a bit different. Yeah. Yeah. I like, we, I like we said also, Christy, about like talking to staff. I think that's so insightful. It made me think, talking to like ex staff, people who have left the organization and, you know, they can just, they're not currently in that, but they can sort of share more of an honest opinion about what was that, what was it like when they were there? If you could somehow get through to those people and LinkedIn is a great place for that. You can just look at people who used to do the role you want to do and talk to them, I guess would be one way forwards. I've always thought like with charities and I'm not, I love charities. I was like, it's like I'm down on them. I'm not, <laughs> but, um, and they did just such great work. Um, but there are still, you know, good and bad within every area. And I always thought like a good measure, I don't know how you'd ever do it, would be to somehow find out what proportion of staff past and present are actually members or supporters of their own charity. Mm -hmm. It's a great gauge, you know, if you could somehow look at a percentage figure or something like that, and it'd be very, very hard to do. But, it, you know, if the people who know the charity, the best people who work for them, you know, and if they know how good that charity is and they really support the cause then they probably should be a, a member of their charity even though they work for them and you know past staff too so yeah if you have a big organization and, and almost none of their staff support th their own cause then it sort of begs a few questions to me but how you'd ever get a hold of those figures i, I never know <laughs> yeah, <laughs> interesting yeah. to Why try are they there <laughs> good day yeah yeah, yeah. maybe like a, a freedom of information request you can do here in the uk yeah yeah loads to think about any other kind of bad and ugly things we might want to share then before we sort of consider sort of wrapping up today yeah yeah maybe adding a layer of good again <laughs> yeah we need like a little prey sandwich some good at the end as well yeah <laughs> I, I have two and they might be the two sides of the same coin like there's there's a bad and and a good i'll do it that way uh, then then we can end i feel good. like these are these are themes that come up, they've come up for me, they've come up for almost everyone I've ever worked with in conservation. Yeah. They come up in, you know, questions we we get asked fairly regularly. And one is one is just for a lot of people, especially people who thrive off that actual direct hands-on contact with conservation work, like being on the front lines, being in the field, um, being quite actively engaged. Um, sometimes it can be hard to find the balance or to shift from those kind of highs or you know peak experiences in the sector mm -hmm. to then sitting behind a desk. Um, not for everyone, you know, because we all have different preferences. But if you're the kind of person who thrives off that that sort of excitement and, and adventure, um, Nando, <laughs> <laughs> especially, I think many of us, but <laughs> Nando's maybe an extreme case. <laughs> You know, it, it can be really hard to shift gears into something that's a lot more, a lot more stable and predictable. And so I think yeah. um, figuring out what the right balance for you is and like looking across 
all aspects of your career and, and your life and, and what you value and what you want to do can really help there. Um, and trying to balance it out, you know, maybe you balance it out within your work or maybe you, you balance it out as I do in my, in my like off work activities where I go to go out and keep adventuring and, you know, <laughs> yeah. keep mm-hmm. being active, et cetera. And so for me, that works super, super well. But I think everyone has to, a lot of people have to contend with that at some point. Yeah, yeah and this, this is a good sector for that because there is flexibility in general to do many different things at a different level. So then you can you can do that. You can invest more. Right now, I'm in a stage where I'm surrounding all my life with work and it's mixing pretty confusingly and excitingly at the same time. I love it. Also, sometimes I really need a rest, a break from it. But you can also choose to, to do a little bit and then have more of your personal life. I, I, I don't know. I feel this is much easier now here than, for example, in academia where I was before. And probably it, the easiest place would be something like, I don't know, the private industry or something. No, uh, In a company, probably it's easier to, to separate your personal life from your, your work life. Yeah, yeah. That, that yeah, I think it's an area where, like, w- w- in my mind, I was thinking about the good, the bad, and the ugly. And, and for me, this is sort of bad or potential <laughs> negative, but it's one of those things we have a lot of control over and yeah. a lot of options, like you're saying, Nando. Um, and, and also a lot more flexibility from, from conservation employers now um, to, to work out a balance and a way of working that works for you, which I think is amazing. Yeah. 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 But don't you, don't you focus struggle sometimes because what you want changes quite quickly? Like this, I have these stages where, mm. oh gosh, I wish I could be in something more stable now so I could, I don't know, take holidays and forget about everything. Mm. And then two weeks later, you are, wow, I will never change this for the world. <laughs> <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. Totally. taking the rough with a smooth yeah mm-hmm. yeah i feel that too i feel like things go through in cycles and again i mentioned it in the past but i see three year cycles i think in in what i've done so far and that year one's always like new and exciting when i'm in a new project or a new role or something like that and i'm learning and that challenge hopefully is a positive thing and then year two you know maybe i've got it down and i'm quite good at it and i'm sort of enjoying the flow almost of the moment mm-hmm. and, and doing the thing i'm doing you know i feel sort of competent and confident all of a sudden And then year three, it can quickly become bored. You know, it's like, I, oh, I've kind of done this for a while now. It's the same thing again, and it's not changed and evolved. So I think the challenge for me is to kind of keep that evolution, keep that that challenge just about right, to sort of stay on the right level in the computer game. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Keeping it fresh, yeah. 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 I, I guess related to, maybe related to all this stuff, and I feel like this is, almost like the elephant in the room of, of conservation because we hear a lot about burnout mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. people and, and different terms for that um but i think overall that that idea of, of being in a sector where you're trying to work for the greater good yeah. and like we talked about earlier we're generally in a community of people who care a lot <laughs> <laughs> more more than the average em- employee perhaps um and so i think we're often prone to overworking for various reasons. Um, I remember when I started in conservation and, you know, I was talking to peers at university and I was sort of moving into my first like internship and job and having this sense that there was an enormous pressure and expectation that I should overwork. And looking back on it, I, I see now that, that that idea was was in my own head largely Mm -hmm. um Mm -hmm. but i think it's really easy to to kind of assume that that is the norm and that is the expectation in the sector and that that's the best way of working um when actually you know i I think the people that i've known um who, who can set their own limits um and and be more productive in the long term those have those have been great people to work with and and often get more done So yeah. I don't know if you guys uh, yes. agree or disagree. <laughs> 100%. Yeah, 
Yeah, you see burnout particularly in like academia. You know, it's, it, the more papers I can publish, you know, and the more conferences I can be at, and it's very easy to sort of measure your impact. And therefore, when do you stop working? You know, if you want to progress, you need to keep producing all the time. So, you know, a lot of academics can work evenings and weekends and can't stop. <laughs> And probably the same in the charity sector, a lot of people, because of the passion, you know, it's like, well, I'm doing this thing, so I believe in it so much, I can't put it down. You know, if I only do a bit more, I can have more of an impact. And yeah, sort of learning. Again, it's all about well-being, isn't it? People looking after themselves nowadays. I often find I have the best ideas when I'm not thinking about work. It's always in the shower <laughs> or on a walk or something, and I need to force myself to go and leave it you know and nowadays I'm quite rigid I start work at you know when I do and I finish when I do and that's that those are quite and I've got a family luckily I need to go and I can't even spend more than a minute you know that I need to I need to go back and re-engage so yeah but I think having clear boundaries just is good for everyone yeah and sort of realize that you can you, you do need to stop yeah. <laughs> and you can say no <laughs> yeah well hopefully there's some positives and some negatives and all that yeah I've really enjoyed it I think, and there's probably more we could say too actually but that's I think quite an honest view actually of some of the kind of pros and cons of and the realities of working in conservation which is what we we're looking to share today thank you guys thanks for joining Christy how was the hey. first podcast was it okay fun <laughs> <laughs> I also feel like you know we could just keep chatting we could just go for another hour and it, the topics might evolve. Um, but uh, maybe one time it would be neat to do one without a set topic, actually, and just see where we end up. Ooh, that's <laughs> brave, isn't it? Just have a chat. <laughs> yeah, we, are, we have these fractal conservation conversations. <laughs> yes. Yeah, exactly. We go down to detail and uh, big picture again. Yeah. yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, thank you both for joining. I've, I always enjoy these chats. These always feel like group therapy to me. So it's kind of fun to <laughs> get these things out in the open. And I hope people listening kind of, you know, enjoy the conversation too and learn a little bit from it. We're always open to topics and suggestions too. So feel free to kind of email us or tweet us or get in touch however you want. Um, and Nando, if people want to learn out more about you and follow you, where should we, where should we point them? You can follow me on social media through Bioblogo. The that's my handle and and then bioblogia.net you can join my email list where i'm about to start writing again after a long hiatus <laughs> <laughs> thank you for your patience <laughs> it's, coming. <laughs> it's, coming it's, coming. it's coming despite being busy you're still going to try and do extra work i like it yeah <laughs> great well thanks both and thank you everyone for listening and until next time this is nick christian nando signing off okay well i hope you enjoyed that everyone if you did, then please do hit the subscribe button to get notified of new episodes as they drop. Um, and also please give us a rating or a review because it really helps us to get in front of more people. Now, if you want our help to get clear and get started and get hired as a professional conservationist, I recommend you enroll in our free online training program, exploring how to get a conservation job. So if you're a student, a job seeker, or a career switcher, you'll learn the golden rule about how to get started, the key mistakes to avoid, and also we'll answer your your biggest questions. You can check that out at conservation-careers.com forward slash free. See you soon.